We have been working with Eightfold for four years, five years, seems like an awful long time, and they have been an incredible partner to us. And so what I'm going to talk about today is, is really three big things. The first is yesterday at the executive meeting, a lot of you were concerned about how we build this skills-based organization. How do we get there from here? So today we released some research on the seven key practices to do this, and I'm going to highlight that for you today. It's called the Pace Setters, and it comes from the research we've been doing with Eightfold for two or three years, which we call the Global Workforce Intelligence Project. So I'm going to talk to you about that. I'm going to talk to you about the economy and what, I, what we call the post-industrial workforce that we're dealing with and why we have all these issues um, in, in, in the organization. And then I want to give you my perspectives on AI. And having spent a lot of time with Ashutosh and a lot of other entrepreneurs in this area, um, I'm developing a fairly sophisticated perspective on what's going on and why I think Eightfold is what I call a second generation AI platform. And what does that mean relative to all the other vendors in the world, all of whom are pa plastering the word AI on all of their products? So first of all, um, you know, what's been going on you know, in, your, in your workforce and in, in hiring in the labor market in general? Um, I mean, I think to me, as a 67-year-old sort of business person, uh, we've had, since the 2008 recession, roughly 15 years of growth, low, low interest rates, zero interest rates, low inflation, hiring, growing, and boom, it all hit the wall. We now have inflation, we now have um, you know, the pandemic has ended, we have the supply chain shortages, the economy has slowed down, a lot of companies have too many people, they're not sure how they got too many people, they weren't practicing systemic HR, like we've been trying to, you know, explain to them. And, um, and now we have this weird situation where um, the employees are burned out, tired, mental health issues. Last night I read that 48% of workers go to work worried every day about whether they're going to be able to do what their manager wants them to do, 48%. So there's this very high level of stress in the workforce, and the management teams and the leadership teams of companies are saying, well, you know, we need, kinda need more out of you guys. You're not being as productive as we would like, and if you saw the Microsoft research a couple of months ago, 87% uh, of employees feel like they're highly productive. Only 17% of executives believe their employees are highly productive. And by the way, that isn't the employee's fault. That's the organization's fault. That's, that's how the organization is set up. That's how we do projects. That's how we do work. Um, and, and in the middle of that, the PwC CEO study that came out only two or three weeks ago found that roughly 60% of CEOs believe that their company as it exists today will not be in business in 10 years at all. It'll be something different, and I'm sure AI is one of the reasons they're thinking that. And of that group, that, that group of 2,000 CEOs, about 70% of them believe they need to be spending more time on transformation and less time on execution. So in the middle of all of these changes and issues we're dealing with, the rate of change of businesses and technologies and industries is accelerating. So that's the reason what you're trying to do is so hard, but it is also so urgent. And so as we talk to you and we talk to many, many companies, we hear these same issues coming up again and again and again. We don't have enough people. We need uh, to hire this certain role that we, that's hard to hire. We have people that are burned out. Uh, we're reorganizing our company. Um, we, oh, by the way, in the middle of this, I'll show you in a middle, minute, something else has happened. Now employees feel like they can't keep up with inflation. So they're coming back to you and their managers and they're saying, you know, it's nice that you're giving me a flexible work environment, it's nice that you're giving me good benefits, but I need a raise. I'm, I'm not keeping up with the standard of living in my community. So all of that, and that's actually kind of a big deal. Um, I think this is the first time that I can remember since the 1970s when uh, pay has become, in a sense, the number one issue in employee experience again. I mean, it's it kind of dropped down to the middle for a long period of time, but it's come back up. So one of the things that Kathy and I just announced last week, we just introduced a whole bunch of research on pay. Um, you're going to have to think about the pay issues in the skills-based organization you're trying to build. And uh, last night when we were talking to some of you, 
Um, you can take pay data and you can put it into Eightfold, and Eightfold's working on this with a couple of clients, and you can see the impact of skills on pay and whether it's going in the right direction, and you can see whether you have pay equity problems and so forth. So, so the new platforms, the talent intelligent platforms like Eightfold can help you with this. <clears throat> and this is sort of striking as well that uh, despite the fact that most of us are white collar workers and we think about that you know, in terms of our lives, uh, the vast majority of the United States is not keeping up. Um, and so, you know, everything you can do to improve pay will make a difference. By the way, one more issue on pay before I move to the next topic. We did a, a pretty significant study on pay equity when we did the big research on rewards. And what we found is that pay equity is not only a legal issue, it's a big, big, big employee engagement issue. Pay equity is 13 times more important to the workforce than their level of pay. People would rather know that what they're paying, getting paid is fair and equitable and transparent than that they're getting a raise and the person next to them isn't or they're, the person next to them is and they're not. So, uh, so start to think about pay as another part of your skills-based organization strategy. Now, the other thing, of course, that's going on is we don't have enough workers. So uh, the unemployment rate keeps going down. You know, the Fed keeps trying to slow down the economy, and they can't, they can't slow down the job creation rate. They can't get the, you know, they kind of want the unemployment rate to go up, but it just won't go up. And the reason it won't go up is we just don't have enough workers. Uh, you know, baby boomers are retiring. The fertility rate is down. Uh, people aren't, kids aren't getting married at the rate they were. Uh, and, and virtually every uh, developed economy, if you, if you look at the, U, at the global census uh, from, a, from the World Bank, and you go around, they, there's a chart in there from country to country, the number of workers is going to peak in every developed country sometime in the next five to ten years, and then it's going to go down. And that problem doesn't go away quickly. I mean, even, even if everybody does have children, you know, very quick, you know, rapidly in the next couple of years, it takes 20 years for them to go to college and then go to work. So we're going to be short of people for a long time. And the way we position it and the way we think about it, you know, as an analyst firm, is we are now living in what you might want to call the post-industrial age. The world is going to be different for a long time. We're going to have a scarcity of labor. We're going to have jobs where every employee adds value in their own unique way. You know, one of the things that I talk about a lot in my book is this shift from jobs to work, where the job definition, the, the job uh, profile that we use for basically everything we do in HR doesn't really define what the job is. And every worker adds value in unique ways to their job, and that's why your company thrives. That's what makes your company successful. That's the reason AI, by the way, won't eliminate every job in business. It'll create new jobs and new opportunities for people, flatter organizations, more internal mobility, um, and a focus on making work more productive for people. That is really what's going on. <clears throat> okay, so given all of that sort of economic stuff and workforce stuff, how do you deal with it? So we've been working with Eightfold now for several years, and when we first started working with Eightfold, the thesis that we, would, that we put forth, and I would say, by the way, this is just a wild idea, I wasn't sure if we're gonna be able to pull this off, was let's look at all the data Eightfold has, which is basically more than a billion employee profiles, let's look at it by industry, and let's look at the skills that are trending up, the skills that are trending down, the job titles that are trending up, the job titles that are trending down, and the careers that are growing and the careers that are shrinking. And believe it or not, we did that. And we, we learned how to do that. And I think Eightfold learned a lot from us, and it probably had some contribution to the workforce planning system that they're introducing to this week also. And what we discovered as we looked at this, and I'll show you the research in a minute, is that we are in a very, very interesting period of time from a business standpoint. If you remember all the talk in the early 2000s about digital transformation, and when I was at Deloitte, it seemed like nothing, that was all we ever talked about, you know, for, for the seven years I was there, was transforming to digital, becoming digital, acting in a digital way, being digital. Well, that's happened. I mean, the pandemic did that. And now that companies are so digitized, the definition of industries is changing, and industries are converging. And what we're finding in virtually every company we talk to is there's a problem going on of some kind where 
you're trying to hire people or develop people or build a business that's in an industry that's adjacent to or different than the one you're in. I mean, last night I read that Elon Musk is going to get into the lithium refining business, right? Did you see that? And he'll probably pull it off. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I, I actually do think he will. But, but this is electric, this is automobile companies getting into electric vehicles and then getting into battery technology and then getting to other sources, uh, how they're going to do chargers. This is retailers getting into healthcare, healthcare delivery, and then healthcare services and buying healthcare insurance companies. This is healthcare companies getting into retail delivery and better technology of their healthcare services. This is telecommunication companies getting into media on and on and on. And of course, what happens when you as a business go into a new industry, that is not just a problem of hiring people. That's a different pay model. That's a different organization model. That's a different reward system. We all learned how to do this in our own industry, but when we get into another industry, it's not quite the same. And that's, that's really where this all research came from. And it seems like every day, Kathy and I, I send Kathy an email almost every day. Here's another industry that's just converged. And here's another one. By the way, Apple getting into banking. You th can you imagine how the consumer banks feel about that right now? I mean, they're scared to death that Apple's going to get into banking. So, so this, is, this is not, that, that, that CEO research from uh, PwC is, it makes sense. You can see why this is going on. So how do we deal with it? Oh, by the way, in the middle of that, workers are transforming too. Now, if you're my age and you've been in the workforce since the 70s, when I entered the workforce, your company was your career. You pretty much latched yourself onto your company and you stayed there for 30 or 35 years and then you retired and that was that. And then we started moving around between companies and then we started saying, well, you know, maybe it's okay that I've had five jobs in the last 10 years. Maybe that won't look bad on my resume. Maybe people want, uh, you know, employees that have had a lot of different experiences. And then we said, well, maybe it doesn't matter what company you worked for. Maybe I want to know what you did. I want to know what work you know how to do. I want to know what projects you worked on. I want to get um, some of your, I don't want your resume of what companies you worked for. I want to know what you did in those companies. And now we're reaching in the point where we basically don't even need to know that. We just want to know what skills you have. How can you prove to me that you know how to do what we're trying to do here? And if you can prove that to me, we don't care if you're full-time or part-time or remote. We are, we're going to bring you in because we need those skills. And that's, that's the other half of this transformation. So what we did is we, we went through and we did all this research. Uh, Kathy and Stella and other people in our organization have been working on this now for several years. And we went through three industries, one industry at a time. We went through healthcare, and I know a lot of you are in the healthcare industry. We went through consumer banking. We're finishing consumer packaged goods. We're going to do pharmaceuticals and then energy next. And we went through the Eightfold Database. And what you can do in the Eightfold Database is you, and you'll find this out if you're not an Eightfold customer, but you know, you probably should be. Um, and I'm, I'm not here to sell you Eightfold, but I'm just a very big fan. Um, you can see in your company the trending skills. You, you can see that information. You can see what skills you have relative to the outside market. You can see if your software engineers are, are highly skilled versus somebody else's software engineers. I mean, you can, you can see this data. And we did that. And we analyzed it, and we wrote these reports. And among the many things we discovered, one of the things we discovered is that in each one of these industries, there are a small set of companies that are way ahead of everybody else. And we decided to call them the pace setters. Because not only are they way ahead financially and business and human capital, uh, but they're accelerating their lead. They're not just ahead now, they're getting further and further and further ahead. And as, as HR you know, analysts, we wanted to know what are they doing that's working so well. So we got under the covers and figured that out. And that's the research we're announcing today. And you can get this research for free. Um, it's available on our website and read through it. So let me give you just a quick summary of what they're doing. And the reason I think this is interesting because I think a lot of you are sitting around having debates inside your company, how are we going to get this talent mobility thing to work? How are we going to do skills-based hiring? How are we going to do skills-based uh, career development and so forth? And this is really what we found. And these are the seven things, so let me walk through them. Number one, um, organization design. Well, let's talk about the first one. Um, 
organizational design around accountability and growth and transformation as well as uh, execution. So let me talk about banking. So you look at bank, we, we, obviously the consumer banking industry in the United States is in, in crisis right now. I mean, they're all struggling. So we did a comparison of consumer banks versus highly efficient consumer banks versus fintech companies. And we looked at the profile of their workers. Dark blue is a typical consumer bank. Orange is a fintech company, like maybe a MasterCard or a Visa or somebody who's sort of, or PayPal, who actually had some disappointing earnings yesterday. Um, and what you see is that consumer banks are 45% of their workers are in the front office, people you, know, you deal with in a branch or in a, over a phone. 30% uh, are in the mid office. The mid office are the people behind the scenes that are running spreadsheets to try to figure out how much interest you should pay on your loan. Uh, by the way, they are using spreadsheets far too much. A lot of that's much more manual than you might think. Um, but there's about 30% of them there, 15% in IT, 10% administration. Their digital competitors are completely different. 20% in front office because they have very, very good digital front ends and digital tools. Only 15% in the mid office because they've automated and uh, digitized a lot of that transaction processing and those decision making things. 55% of people in IT, a huge difference in IT, and then about the same in administration. And, and that is an example of how this differs. And this is, this is uh, if you compare the 10% pay setters to the average banks to the fintechs. And take a look at this. If you look at the light blue here, which is IT, from 15% in the traditional banks to 20% in IT, in a large bank, that's 3,600 people. That's not a, just a, that's a huge difference. So in some sense, these pay setter banks are really more like tech companies and less like traditional banks. So that's number one. Number two, if you look at the roles in the pay setter companies, the job titles, there's a very significant difference in the percentage of people in different job titles. So what we did, thanks to, with some help from Eightfold, is we looked at all of the job titles in these companies. And there's thousands and thousands of job titles. And we clustered them into similar jobs because a lot of times it's the same job with a different name. And what we found is that the companies that are in this top 10% have a significantly higher percentage of workers in IT, which we'll talk about more later, and in what we call transformation roles. So look at the second bar here. Innovation manager, management consultant, process manager, project analyst, workshop facilitator. You know, we were joking about this last night in the executive session. Those are jobs that do not exist in traditional banks. So if you want to do a transformation, or you want to do a reorg, or you want to move people around from you don't have a lot of people to help you do that. I was just, actually had a funny conversation with a friend of mine who works for an insurance company, a very successful insurance company, and he said, you know, we have great products, we have a great brand, we have great pricing, but our sales process is horrible. We have this horribly old IT system. We have old Salesforce process. I have to fill everything out by hand. It takes me forever to get these, pre these um, things done. And I said, well, why don't you guys just do a little transformation and do some sales automation? He goes, we have nobody to do it. We have no transformation staff anywhere in the company that's even able to do this. And if, of course, if they hire a consulting firm to do it and the consulting firm leaves, they, they can't keep it up. So these companies, in a sense, have designed their organizations for continuous change. So that's a second finding. Um, same thing is true, by the way. That's the healthcare example. This is the banking example. They have different titles, but look at these job roles. So in a sense, in some ways, you know, this is kind of a nice thing for HR people. All the stuff that we need, need you know, kind of know how to do in HR as consultants is what's badly needed. To, to keep your company alive during this transformation. Number three, the pay setter companies have higher percentage of cutting edge skills. So if you're a bank and 90% of your software engineers are COBOL programmers, you're not gonna get onto the cloud in any big hurry. You're not gonna do AI in any big hurry. You're not gonna do big data in any big hurry. You're gonna have to reskill them. So sure enough, 
there's a distinct uh, statistical difference in the cutting edge, the percentage of employees that have cutting edge skills in these transformational companies. Now, I don't really need to oversell that because most of you know this. But um, it, again, if you look at healthcare, look at the technologies in the top 10% in healthcare Python, MATLAB, R, SQL, Agile, et cetera. These are healthcare companies. And the reason they need those skills is they're automating stuff as fast as they can in the healthcare industry. Healthcare industry is um, you know, desperate for clinical professionals and they have to do automation too. In banking, it's the same thing. If you look at skills by what we call traditional tech skills, uh, that are stable or declining versus rising. By the way, one of the fascinating things you can do in, eight, in Eightfold, Eightfold has a time series database. So you can look at the skills in your company today and you can look at what they were five years ago and you can see which ones grew and which ones shrunk. And that's a very interesting thing to look at if you look at that compared to others. And again, what you find is the, what we, by the way, we changed the name from Trailblazer to Pace Setter. That's the reason that's incorrect. Um, that they're, they're significantly higher um, ratio of what we call trending skills, emerging skills, growth skills in, in various forms of, of the business. Number four, they prioritize mobility and reskilling in a very strategic way. I'm going to talk about, in a couple of minutes, something we call systemic HR. What we find in virtually every company we talk to is that you will never recruit your way out of your talent shortage. It's simply not possible. There aren't enough people. It's going to cost too much to hire them. It's going to take too long. And, uh, you know, it's just, in some cases, they're, they're just not there. And so uh, what these companies do is they have a very strategic focus on internal mobility, understanding the jobs inside of the company, carefully understanding them, and giving people development plans to get there. So this is an example of a very, very interesting bank in the Netherlands called ING Bank. ING Bank is a company we've known for a long, long time. And they found that one of the most important jobs in ING, they are basically, basically an agile organization, they run an agile, is a product manager. Most banks don't have product managers. They just don't even know what that concept is. They don't think about it that way. And so what they did, as you can see from this, is they went through and they decomposed the specific skills that are needed in product management and ING, and you can see what they are. And then they use those skills to put together a job description and a job profile and a set of skills for product management in ING. And as a result of doing that, now they can look at the skills of all of their workers and they can figure out who is close or partly ready for these jobs and product managers and then make that available to them through a talent marketplace or some kind of a system to do this. So that's the kind of thing that goes on in banking. Similar things go on in healthcare. Number five, these companies are willing to change the employment model, change the employment relationship, or change the job to fill the gap. Let's go back to healthcare for a minute. So according to the research we've done on healthcare, which Kathy led, and you're gonna hear from Kathy in a little bit later, um, in the United States alone, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of hospitals, hundreds, and by the way, the healthcare industry is the largest employer in the United States. Almost 16 to 17% of American workers actually work in healthcare, which is staggering. Most people don't realize that. And there are only about 200 to 250,000 nurses graduating from nursing school every year, and there will be a shortage of around 2.1 million uh, nursing or clinical professionals within two to three years. So there's a big gap there. So we went through and carefully figured out of all the people in nursing uh, in these companies, how much recruiting can they do? Well, they can recruit maybe over the next two years, 350,000. Let's suppose they can keep the nurses. You know, in a lot of uh, hospitals, nurses, the, inert, the average age of a nurse, I think, is 52, 53. They're, they're burned out from the pandemic. They're retiring. Turnover rate is very, very high. So if we do the best we can to improve retention, I'll show you a little bit more on that in a minute, we could save 400,000. That's 19%. Let's suppose we build a career pathway and we move people from a, an environmental services job into a nursing job. That's about a two-year career path. By the way, most hospitals do that. Healthcare companies are very, very good at developing people into new careers because they have to. That gives you about half a million people. 
you're still short 850,000 people. So what are hospitals doing? They're redesigning the job of the nurse. They're saying, we've got to get these, we have to get nurses to work at what is called the top of their license. We need to, you know, stop, you know, get rid of the administration, get rid of the scheduling work they do. And this is, uh, you know, one of the keys that we found in these pace, pace setter companies is they are able to think about this problem as a systemic problem and look at all four of these issues together. To give you an example of how we visualize this, this is the 4R model that we've been using as part of the systemic uh, HR research. And basically what we're finding is that if you think about all four of these things together, typically they're in different parts of HR. Recruiting's over in talent acquisition. Retention is over in employee experience group or maybe there's a you know, project going on to deal with retention. Reskilling's in L&D, and redesign is in the business, and maybe HR is not even a part of it. So what these healthcare companies do, because they're in such a desperate shortage of nurses, uh, they are doing all of this. And you can see some of the things they're doing that's working. And I know there's some folks here from Children's Healthcare, I think, in, in Texas that are doing this. They even have dedicated HR teams, entire groups of HR professionals, only focused on the clinical roles so that they, they can come up with systemic solutions for this. Okay. Uh, and then the final thing, of course, is collaborating as a C-suite. Because if you're going to deal with this kind of a transformation, it can't be HR alone. You're going to be touching regulatory issues. You're going to be touching work arrangement issues. You're going to be touching pay issues, um, all of that together. So that's a little bit of an overview of how you deal with change in this transformational environment that we live in. Download the report, read it, come back, call us if you'd like to talk more about it. Um, next thing I want to talk about is HR. So um, one of the things that came out of all this research and many, many of the clients we've talked to over the years is the way our profession has changed. And when we started our academy in 2018, one of the, the sort of theories or the concepts behind it was that we need full stack HR professionals. We need HR people that aren't just recruiters, just L&D people, just pay people, just DEI people. And you guys know this, is the best parts of your career have probably been when you've worked on projects and learned how all of these different things fit together. We also found, of course, that you can't copy practices out of a book. Uh, when I was a young analyst in the early part of my career in HR, I would go to companies and I would always get the same question, uh, just tell me how GE does this because we, we just want to copy them. And that just doesn't happen anymore. So we need you know, a, an organization within the HR function that is highly skilled, interconnected, and cross-trained. And as we found out from the research in the pace setter work and the GWI work and all the other client work we've been doing, is that virtually everything you do is connected together. When we were talking to pay, you know, compensation and benefit managers uh, last week in Las Vegas, and we were showing them the issues of pay equity and the issues of, uh, of, of pay transparency and some of the things they're dealing with, and we showed them the fact that in our pay model, or rewards model, Career is a part of rewards, flexibility is a part of rewards, development is a part of rewards. The compensation and benefit managers say, well, that's not my department, I don't do that, that's them. You know, I'm worried about the pay stuff, you need to talk to the L&D people. Well, it actually is part of your job because the reward system is all of those things. And that's the same thing for recruiting, that same thing of retention. Um, every problem that you deal with or every transformational issue that you find in your company somehow involves all of these things. Well, we didn't set up HR for that. HR, in many ways, to me, feels like a 1980s IT department. We've got COEs for this, and we've got COEs for that, and we've got a little group over here, and we've got some business partners trying to stitch all this stuff together, and we're optimized around service delivery costs. And by the way, you know, we just had a turn, downturn, so we're gonna get rid of a bunch of the HR people because we don't need them anyway. I mean, a staggering conversation I had with Accenture three weeks ago when they went through the big layoff. I don't know if you saw the data. I think they laid off, I don't know, 18 or 19,000 people. They laid off almost a third of the HR department at Accenture. And I was just shocked to hear that, that they considered HR to be that you know, discretionary in their organization. Well, I mean, if we're not operating this way, that's what happens. 
And so what we're trying to do in this research, and we, the reason we call it systemic, and this is something that I just sort of occurred to me, is it's like the human body. Think about the human body. When you get an infection from, you know, your toe or you step on a nail or whatever it is, all sorts of things happen in your body to try to respond to that. All of your organs, all of your cells, all of your response systems work together to fix that problem. That's really the problem we have in our organizations. Every problem that looks like a training problem might be a management development problem. It might be an org design problem. It might be a pay problem. It might be an employee experience problem. I mean, it, or it may be a selection and hiring problem, right? So we need to be able to go to market inside of our companies in a complete and integrated way. And that's the reason we built this framework. And what we found in the pace setter research, and it was really the pace setter research that helped us conceptualize this idea, is that this idea of doing all these things together is going to be one of the most powerful things you can do. By the way, as I talk about AI in a minute, platforms like Eightfold are, are going to make this possible. And I was just talking to Sachin about this outside, is that um, traditionally, if you're being asked to hire a bunch of people by some hiring manager, you don't know what his retention rate is. You don't know what his uh, internal mobility is. He doesn't know what it is either. That data is somewhere else. You're just worrying about talent acquisition and how, how, how long it's going to take to hire these people and where you're going to place the job ads and you know, what does the job description look like. We need to bring together data so that you can operate this way. And I actually think you're going to find Eightfold is a pretty good platform for doing that. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit about that. I'm not going to belabor this. We're going to be doing more work on this. We're going to talk about this at our conference. We're going to really launch this research in the fall. But that is one of the things we've learned from the pace setter research that I think will help you deal with these issues of skills. Like if you, if you read the white paper on skills-based organization, whichever one you read, and you decide we want to do this, you, this is not an L&D problem. This is going to touch everything. So, uh, so this is a good way to think about how you're set up and how you're operating. OK, so uh, let me change gears and talk about the third thing, AI. <clears throat> so you know, I, think, I thought Ashutosh gave an absolutely wonderful presentation uh, yesterday morning on the, on the reasons for AI, why it's taken off. Uh, let me give you my perspective on what we've seen. First of all, um, I'm a tech guy. I'm in my almost my 70s, late 60s. I entered the workforce in 1978. I worked in mainframes. I worked on PCs. I went to work in the database industry. I worked on you know, business analytics and what we used to call data warehousing. And I've seen this market evolve. And one of the things that's happened that you may not be aware of is the tech industry has just done incredible things with technology. It used to be that if you wanted to build a data warehouse about your people, you had to spend millions of dollars on computers, database software, you had to hire consulting firms, you had to build extraction and transformation software. And even if you did it really, really well, it probably didn't work right because you didn't get all the data correct. And all these things on the left were developed to do that. And then we had what were called multi-dimensional databases. By the way, how many of you are familiar with Vizier? You know what Vizier is? Vizier is a multi-dimensional database. It, it stitches together lots of data and connects it to each other automatically. And then around the time of the web and uh, the search engines and Google and, and, and Facebook, we came up with this idea of a massively parallel database. Inside of Google, inside of Facebook, inside of Amazon, the database is all over the place. It's not in one system. It's, it's segmented into what are called shards or pieces, and it's running in parallel. And all of a sudden, we could process data hundreds of times faster at a fraction of the cost. And that gave birth to probably the fastest growing company on the planet, Snowflake, if you know who they are, which was one of the most highly capitalized tech companies in the market. And these other platforms, these guys got bought by, uh, by Workday, um, and we had these massively fast systems. Well, what comes next? Let's use this data for something. And as Ashutosh told you yesterday, that's why AI has taken off. The neural networks that are underneath the covers of AI, and I've been sort of looking at this, were around for a long time. People were playing around with neural networks a long time ago, but they weren't considered to be that powerful. 
they weren't working very well because they didn't have a lot of nodes. They didn't have a lot of parameters. Well, once the computing part, uh, platform got cheap enough, they could build billion parameter neural networks and throw terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data, and they miraculously started to work. And I'm telling you, when you read and you talk to these computer scientists, they weren't even sure it was going to work either. It's almost like they invented something that they didn't know, you know, how it was going to behave. And so uh, we are now living in this world where platforms like, like Eightfold can store billions of employee records, and it's not really a big deal, and it works pretty fast. By the way, it is complicated. I'm not saying this is easy to do. Um, according to some research by BCG, 75 to 80 percent of the internally developed large language model projects inside of companies fail because they don't really know how to do this. So that there's actually a lot of tricky technology and operations that goes on in companies like Eightfold that I'll talk to you about in a minute. So, so what happened is we came up with this different idea. So the difference between a traditional computing system and AI system, to keep it very, very simple, is one thing. In a traditional computing system, a software engineer writes a bunch of code, figures out what the workflow is, sticks it in front of a user, a user types stuff into it, and it stores data. And then you go in and you look at the data and you figure out what's going on. In an AI system, it's the complete opposite. You take a whole bunch of data, some of which you know, might be in your company, some of which may not, of, a, of a, a corpus of data that's interesting to you, that's important to you, and you run all sorts of statistical models to figure out what that data is telling you. And it is a totally different system. And so these systems on the right, like Eightfold, have models running in them, and, and Eightfold is constantly updating its models to make them better and better and better to figure out what a high performer looks like, to figure out whose skills, what skills, where skills are coming from. Are skills coming from the resume? Are skills coming from the job history? Are skills coming from the projects? Are skills coming from something else? And so these are very, very different systems. And what you end up having when you run a company, uh, you, you put together a system like Eightfold, is what we call a talent intelligence database. And we were the ones that kind of came up with this name a long time ago, working with Eightfold, uh, because it's not a traditional ERP database. The data you have in Workday isn't really that interesting. It doesn't tell you that much. The data in Eightfold is very interesting. It tells you a lot. It has much more depth, it has much more richness and complexity to it, and you can add data to it. You can add performance data, you can add textual data, you can add salary data, you can add code. One of, so a lot of the uh, implementations of Eightfold and other of these systems connect the talent intelligence system to GitHub, so for a software engineer, we can see specifically exactly what kind of code they know how to write because we can read it in GitHub and attach it to the neural net to give you information about what this person's skills really are. Imagine if you put drilling uh, you know, experience from a drill, uh, you know, somebody that does drilling in an oil company, or nursing certification data for different classes of nursing can go in there. So this is a very, very different type of system and a very, very powerful one. What it does for HR is it gives you a new role. It gives you a new life. Now, I talked about this a year ago. If you remember, those of you that were here last year when we were up in Napa, I talked about this, this function that I call the talent intelligence function. And, and I think it really is a new job class inside of HR where you have a group of people that spend some time looking at this data and informing you and your CHRO and your CEO about where the, you know, where the skills are, where the skills are weak, where the skills are strong, and what we can do to change and to improve. And I know people that have this job. I know the guy who does this at Amazon, and we just interviewed him. We've talked to quite a few of these people, and he is a strategic advisor to Amazon when they want to open a new distribution center, when they want to hire a new executive, when they want to buy a new company, they go to him and they ask him, what are we getting here? What are, what are, what are the glitches? What are the things we have to watch out for? So this is some really, really fascinating stuff you can do. <clears throat> um, some of the examples are very, very easy to understand. If you go back to the 4R model and think about those four things that might actually be in four different parts of HR, 
these are very, very common questions you're going to ask. You know, what are the career pathways that we need to build more software engineers or more nurses or more salespeople or more marketing people or more financial auditors? Um, where should we locate this uh, particular operation to take advantage of the skills in the workforce in that location? Uh, you know, how do we improve the diversity of our recruiting? How do we remove the bias we have for job history or job or, or employer or college degree? Anyway, these are all the kinds of things that can be done in talent intelligence, and that's why I think this is such a significant space. Now, I just gave a, a pitch last night on HR tech to a big group, and uh, we, we have these layer models that we show on the tech market, and a lot of you may have, may have seen them, and the bottom of the layer is usually the core HR system, you know, the Workday, the Oracle, the SAP, the payroll system, and then on top of that, there's employee experience platforms, and there's recruiting tools and learning tools and so forth. What I have started to draw is in the middle, this green layer, which I call the intelligence layer because the intelligence layer really sits on top of these systems. You don't need to replace your payroll system, you don't have to need to replace your training system or your ATS or any of that. These systems like Eightfold are, are really capturing the intelligence of all of the activity going on in those systems, plus adding a lot more. And I think what you're gonna see starting right now is a massive growth in the value that you can achieve from these intelligence systems that you cannot get from the ERPs. Now, I'm not here to bash Workday. I'm very good friends with Workday or anybody else. But there is a maturity model to getting this right. And so as I've talked to vendors, let me share with you a little bit of thinking here. And, and we're working on a white paper on this. By the way, this, just to, to show you, this is the picture I was, I was referring to, if you want to look at this picture. Um, by the way, we'll figure out some way to get you guys some slides. You don't have to take pictures of everything. I mean, I love having my picture taken, but <laughs> it's not necessary. Uh, so, so let me tell you about this, because this is coming out. I'm working on this white paper. I have a lot of people collaborating with me on this, but I, I want to run it by you guys. So because these AI systems are so different, it isn't really fair for every vendor at every tech show to say they have AI. I mean, that is really confusing. Uh, we don't know what that means. There's all sorts of aspects to AI. It's used for different things. There's different types of AI. There's, there's different applications of AI. So I would, I would basically say that I think the vendors fall into three categories. There's vendors that have applicant tracking systems or learning management systems or uh, maybe learning experience platforms or uh, assessment tools, or whatever it may be, and they are, you know, running their companies very well, selling you the stuff that they do, and they are adding AI to it. And they might be adding generative AI. Generative AI is the easiest thing to add because everything that has to do with text or writing an email or sending a message to a candidate or whatever can be immediately informed with ChatGPT. So, so you'll see a lot of vendors that are adding AI features to their products to make them more interesting, uh, more useful, uh, you know, especially in L&D, by the way. In L&D, there's just tons of them building generative tools. So that's number one. Nothing wrong with them, but that's what I call in the green. In the middle are the bigger vendors that have been doing AI for a while, but they're not using large language models. Example of that is Workday. I was at the Workday Analyst Conference and I had a very pointed conversation with the head of technology there about this new stuff. At the time, it was only open AI. We didn't have all the large language models out quite yet. And they basically said, we already do AI. We have machine learning all over Workday. It's filled with machine learning. In fact, the whole analyst presentation for three days was about how much AI they already have, and we don't really need to take advantage of this new stuff. I don't know if that's true. Now, I'm not going to tell you Workday isn't working on this. They probably are. But they don't have it today. You're not going to see something like Eightfold in the Workday Skills Cloud. The Workday Skills Cloud is a relatively simple but sophisticated database in the traditional manner. It's not doing what uh, Eightfold does. It's not a neural network, um, large language model, deep learning system. Now, they're going to try it get it from there from here, and I'm sure they're working on that, but they didn't come from that base. The third generation are the vendors 
that were sticking their necks out, taking a lot of risk, maybe weren't sure if they were going to make it, that built AI-centric systems. And that's what Eightfold is. And there are others. There's Seekout, there's Gloat, there's a couple of others. And those vendors are the ones that are going to have the most rapidly changing transformational impact on the things I talked about earlier. Now, um, I, I don't want to get into too much about, oh, this is sort of the idea of this, that this green layer actually becomes bigger and bigger and more important. Let me tell you a funny story. Um, I know I'm out of time, but I'll, I'll wrap up in a minute. Uh, we had a long conversation with a large uh, food services company, and they have Oracle systems all over the world, different you know, shapes and sizes. And they said, we're going to get Oracle HCM Cloud and replace it all. And I said, why are you doing that? They said, well, we don't have a single, we don't have a single database for our employees, and we think, we, we, we think this will help us do that. We just can't find everybody. And I said, that's an awfully expensive way to do that. Did you think about putting a talent intelligence layer on top of that and maybe putting all the data in there and having it reach out into all these other systems? They couldn't understand what I was talking about. I couldn't get it get through to them, so they went off and they're doing this. Um, this green thing, uh, which we call talent intelligence, you can call it whatever you want, has an enormous amount of power and it can do an enormous number of things. One more thing and then I'll wrap up. So what about the risks of this? Is this stuff going to kill you? Is this stuff going to take over the world? Is it going to come to life and destroy humanity? Um, these are three of the pioneers in the market. Um, you know, Jeffrey Hinton is the guy who really came up with the neural network in the first place. Uh, Jan LeCun is the head of uh, AI at Meta. And uh, Ilya is the head of AI and technology at OpenAI. Uh, they're, they're worried, but they are not concerned. And so uh, I would not slow down. I would take advantage of this and look at it. You, you heard yesterday about the EEOC issues and the bias issues. We're going to all have to learn how to do this. Um, and I think there's going to be incredible benefits to it. Generative AI has dozens and dozens of applications. Um, this big data AI has dozens and dozens of applications. I think it's going to go a long, long way. So anyway, thank you for the opportunity to spend 45 minutes up here talking to you. Uh, we are very close friends with Eightfold. Uh, we've had a wonderful working relationship with them. But, but generally, we're here to help you. I'll help you understand this, help you figure out how to implement it, help you put together a roadmap, and help you just learn about what's going on in this incredibly important part of our industry. So thank you for the opportunity, everybody.